Welcome to our session today about the launch of HMRC's new additional information form coming 1st of August 2023. Um, today's webinar is one of the many opportunities that we have lined up to help our customers stay informed and be prepared. Um, Jen's going to be taking us through what you need to know and how to start getting ready. So come August, there are no surprises uh, from what type of account you need, what new information you need to supply, uh, the implications for not being aware of the new submission process and very importantly we'll be talking about how whisper claims is supporting you our customers so there is no need to panic we have got you um, as we go through the session today don't forget to fire through any questions um, we prefer to leave the chat box free for anybody who wants to talk to us directly and also so that we can use that as a space to share contact details uh, near the end of the session so please do drop your questions in the q a box and we will get to them um, as soon as we can there's quite a lot to get through today so um, over to you jen oh, thanks Sus. great so um Briefly, I'm going to be covering what's actually coming. So a little bit of background on the additional information form. I'm going to talk through what you as R&D advisors, R&D people that are helping are helping people with R&D claims need to do to be ready. And I'm going to go through in as much detail as I can in the time, uh, what you need to do to actually fill out the form, all the different sections and what they're asking for. So what's coming so yes this is something that hmrc announced last summer that they were going to be looking for additional information they're actually for the first time mandating a certain level of information to support uh, claims for r&d tax relief um we didn't actually see the form for the first time until early january there'd been a little bit of information around what they were going to ask for the list of what they were going to ask for hasn't actually lined up completely with the form some things have been put in some things have gone away again um but the form is currently live, um, so you can go on and have a look at it yourself. Um, you can just Google sort of additional information form for R&D and it'll take you there. Um, but the key thing and the reason that uh, I think R&D, uh, the R&D sector as a whole is scrambling a little bit at the moment, is that when this form was first demoed and right up to the March statement, this form is going to come into force for claims starting on or after 1st of April 2023. So everyone was kind of like, that's fine. You know, those claims won't wash through until this time next year. We can get to it. What happened at the March statement is HMRC um, changed that. And now from the 1st of August, all claims. So every single claim submitted to HMRC after the after, on or after the 1st of August has to be accompanied by an additional information form. So it doesn't matter the claim dates, how old the claim is, that you could have prepared the claim three months ago and not submit it to August. If it's going in to HMRC after the 1st of August, it will have to be accompanied by an additional information form. So it's an online form. It's fairly simple. It's a bit lacking in certain areas, in my opinion. Uh, there's a little lack of um, validation, for example, and things like information that could be pulled in from other sources, but it's fine. It's a very simple online form. Um, it must be submitted ahead of the CT600. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. But you, if you submit the CT600, then go back and fill in the form, HMRC would see that claim for R&D tax relief as being invalid. And what they've said is they'll just remove that from the CT600 as they process it. So if they can't find a form that was submitted before, I'm assuming even one minute before the CT600 goes in, they will just invalidate everything. So you need to make sure that you're ready for this and that you're doing it at the right time. So that's what's coming. So there's a few things that you guys, as people who prepare R&D claims on behalf of other people need to be doing to be ready. So first of all, just make sure you can access the form and you can submit it on behalf of your client. So I know I can access it, but I can only access it for my own company. We're not um, people that do R&D claims on behalf of other people. If you want to be able to do it for anybody but your own company, you will need an agent services account with HMRC. Now, I know that most accountants will already have this, but it's definitely worth checking, going into the form and making sure you can do it. When I sign in, because I don't have an agent services account, I can only see one form. I don't get any choice to add forms for other companies, anything like that. The one form I can do is for Whisper Claims itself. So if you want to be able to submit claims on behalf of anyone else, you will need an agent services account. And obviously starting to register for that now, all these things take a bit of time with HMRC. So if you need to do that, I would get on that straight away. And as I say, the form is accessed through the government gateway. So it's a quick and easy way to check. Um, you can use your current credentials to sign in and see what kind of interface you get. And if you aren't faced with a way to 
add clean, add multiple forms and do them for people that aren't your own company, then you need to get on that. So making sure you can access the form, number one. So the thing to do would be to familiarize yourself with the additional information form. So Susan and I were chatting earlier, and obviously most people that have been doing um, claims for any length of time will already be gathering 99% of the stuff that HMRC are asking for, but obviously probably haven't been submitting it to HMRC in the format that they've been asking for it. Um, for example, there's mandated numbers of projects that you might have to describe, and it might be you've done only done one or two up till now, and from now on you might have to do 10 for the same client, that kind of thing. So just getting familiar with the, the information that HMRC are asking for, the format they're asking for it in, and making sure that you know what that is, making sure you can access the form, and just walking through it with dummy information a few times so that you're not trying it for the first time with a hard deadline claim on the 31st of August and finding that you've missed something, can't get hold of your client to ask that last question, anything like that. So it's really, really important that you're, you've had that practice time, you've had to go through it and you know what you're doing. Um, as I say, it's a simple form, but it is quite long. Uh, even using dummy information and going through all the fields, you're looking at 15 to 20 minutes to fill it out um, just to answer all the questions. And if you're having to do any toing and froing, if you've missed something, it will take significantly longer. So being making sure you can access the form, being familiar with it, absolutely essential ahead of the 1st of August. So third thing you need to do is actually look at, as I say, if you've been doing this for any length of time, you will have your own claim preparation process. You're almost certainly gathering everything HMRC needs, but it's making sure that you've reviewed that process and updated it so that you can comply with all of HMRC's needs. So as I say, HMRC mandate how many projects have to be described in detail. And I'll go into that when I'm talking about the form but um, you can't get away with describing fewer than they want. The form will not let you proceed if you haven't described enough projects. Um, you know, the way that HMRC want the costs to be um, entered is that you're gathering all the costs under all the usual cost categories, all the ones you'd expect to see. Um, but they also want that split into SME and RDEC. So if you've got a mixed claim, you need to have divided all the staff costs into SME and RDEC, all the raw materials costs into SME and RDEC and that kind of thing. So that's probably a little bit more detail than you have been doing. Some people will have been doing that already, but making sure you've got that. And then that total amount for both SME and RDEC needs to be divided among all of the projects in the claim. So if you're, if you're claiming for 25 different projects, you may need to have divided all of the costs amongst the 25 projects. HMRC won't ask for it in detail for all 25, but you need to have done that to make sure you're giving them the right information. So again, you will have been gathering that, but it's just making sure that you've got it in the way that HMRC want to see it. Um, another key point in terms of sort of preparation process is the form has to be submitted within 28 days or it will be deleted. So I came across this other week. I was wanting to demo the form to the team at Whisper Claims and I went in and the form I've been working on was just gone. There was no mention of it. It wasn't there anymore at all. Um, so it's not even that I had been going in and out of the same form and playing with it while I was preparing this webinar, for example. Um, so even though I had been working on it when it got to day 28, it just went away. I'm hoping HMRC will change this. But for now, it's got to be submitted within 28 days. So you need to either have all the information up front so you can just go in, fill it out and submit it straight away or be confident that you can get that information within the 28 days so that you're not filling out 99% of it and then having it disappear. The other point about the form, which could affect how you prepare your claims, is you can't view or... I don't think I meant delete. Um, you can't view or edit it. That should say edit. Um it can't view or edit the form after submission. So you can't do, this is something we see a lot from our Whisper Claims users, is quite often they'll have filled out most of the, the claim, they'll show it to their client and they'll come back and want to go back and forward, you know, up to 10 times, making small tweaks and changes. And that's not going to be possible with additional information forms. So again, when you come to do the form, you've got to be sure that the information you're putting in is the final information. Because if you go over that 28 days and you haven't submitted, it'll get deleted. If you submit it, you'll then have to, what HMRC say is if you want to edit something after submission, you need to fill out a whole new form again. That's where they're not being able to view it becomes an issue because if you filled out, so with the project descriptions, you could theoretically have put in 20,000 words for four different sections and you then 
can't get back to that. You can't see it. You can't copy and paste it into a new version of it. You can download a PDF at the point of submission, but once that's passed, you've got no way to access it again. Um, the final thing to that will affect your claim preparation process is you've got to fill out one form for each corporation tax period. So if your client has an 18 month um, accounting period, you will need to fill out one form for the 12 month, 12 month part and one form for the six month part. So again, you're going to need to divide the costs into those two periods to make sure you, you're um, accurately um, putting in the costs and it's going to need to line up with the, the CT 600s that are being submitted for those two periods. Um, you can't get past that. You cannot put um, a clean period that's more than a year into the into the form in the portal. So you can't kind of budget or anything like that. It's It will go take it up to a year and that's it. Weirdly, there's no other validation on the the dates for the clean period. You can be doing one that's 10 years in the, in the future. You can be putting one in that's um, completely... Um, you know, it's past its our deadline, but you could be put in a form for 2018 claim and it would still accept it. But what it won't accept is anything longer than a year. So you just need to be making sure that you've divided everything up into the two periods appropriately before you come to fill out a claim and obviously allow the time for the fact you're going to have to fill in two claims. Whereas I know that when I've done this in the past and most people, if you're doing an 18 month accounting period, you would have prepared one R&D tax report for that period. So you're now going to have to produce two. Okay, so there's a lot there that will involve about tweaking, especially on timings for the, the claim preparation process. And then the final thing to think about is claim submission process. So because the additional information form, additional information form has to be submitted ahead of the CT600, you need to make sure that that is built in to your submission process. Now, if you are a consultant who does this on behalf of clients who then, and you hand this to an accountant, to actually do the, the CT600 work, you, for example, will need to work out whether it's you or the accountant that's filling out the additional information form on behalf of that client and who's going to do that when and how you're going to make sure that that's communicated so that you know the timings don't slip and you end up submitting it slightly late. Um, the other thing is there's a slight change to CT600. So there's box 657 now needs to be checked. So that's... Um, that box is saying I have submitted the additional information for. So obviously there's a there's check at the CT600 side, but I know um, that from previous experience, if you forget to check a box in the CT600 related to R&D tax relief, then HMRC will see that as invalid. So again, it's really, really important to make sure that these additional steps are put into your claim submission process so that you don't uh, just accidentally end up submitting something that's invalid and HMRC disallow it. So that's, in a nutshell, all the sort of small things you need to think about to get ready. So just making sure you're familiar with the form, making sure you can access the form, and then making sure that your processes are up to date and incorporating everything you need to do to make sure that everything is submitted on time. The question, I'm waiting for this question to come up, so I'm just going to hit it before we get there. You cannot avoid using the form. Everything. And I'm going to keep talking about the 1st of August, but all claims submitted after the 1st of August must be accompanied by a form. So what I will say is if you have claims you could be working on right now, so you've got clients that have already passed their year end, you're working on their claims, it would be a really good idea to submit those before the 1st of August. Um, it means that you, you're not required to fill in the form. You can if you want to. But you're not required to, so you can get through as many claims as you want between now and the 1st of August, which means you can start that new process with a clean slate without a backlog of claims that you've got to then go back to the client and, you know, ask for more information because of slight differences in the way the form, the what you need for the form compared to what you used to submit. So our recommendation is getting every claim in you can before the 1st of August. There's also, as we all know, HMRC isn't always on it when it comes to IT. So I have my concerns that come August, if everybody starts to put claims through really, really quickly, it's going to fall over, it's going to fall apart, you're not going to submit it. There's always a chance that it won't work. So again, any especially sort of August year end claims, um, sorry, or August deadline claims, it might be a really good day to get those in in June and July, just to make sure that you're not, as I say, sitting on a huge backlog, and then you find HMRC's site has fallen over and you can't get them submitted. So as I say, getting them in beforehand means you can avoid the form because 
it's only valid from it's only mandated from the 1st of August but otherwise if you're submitting on or after the 1st of August you have to do the form there's nothing you can do to avoid it so what does the form actually involve so this is the slightly more detailed and maybe more boring section of the webinar but let's see how we go so the form is divided into four sections the first section is super simple all it wants is the business details so that it can line up this particular form with a, with any particular CT600 that's been submitted. So business name, obviously you'll know that it's your client. Um, the UCR, again, if you're preparing the CT600 on their behalf, you should have that. If you're a consultant, you might not, and you might want to ask the client for that up front, making sure you've got it. Um, those two are absolutely mandatory. So you have to have those. That is how the, the form is validated. I know this because you can't put in a made up UTR. It has to be a, a valid UTR. Um, and I th I'm fairly sure this is how HMRC in the background are going to line up the forms with the CT the CT600 that's been submitted. Because obviously they've got a huge amount of work of their side to validate whether someone has actually put in a form for that particular claim at the right time and all that kind of thing. So business name and UTR are really, really important. Um, it also asks in this section for a PAYE reference if the company has one to ask, does it have a reference number? Yes or no. And then asks for the number and the same for VAT. So those are optional, but probably advisable to put them in just to make sure. So Belt and Braces approach to making sure HMRC can recognize the form you put in as being for the client that you're working with. Um, and the last one in this section is the SIT code for the company. Now they don't ask for it as SIT code. They say something about what's the main business activities of this company, something wording like that. But when you start to type in the box, it starts bringing up a list of SIT codes. Now, this is again a point where I feel the form is a little bit lacking. Um, you can put in any old SIT code in this box. Um, it doesn't validate it against Companies House. It's not looking to see whether it's actually the SIT code at Companies House for this company. So Again, knowing what the actual SIT code for your company is is really important um, because you probably want to make sure it lines up with all the other information HMRC would have about the company. You don't want to start putting in the wrong SIT code or anything like that. And again, this feels like a lot of the inquiry work HMRC have done recently has been around claims from companies with non-technical SIT codes. So clearly they want to be able to gather a lot more data about where claims are coming from, what sectors they're working in, all that kind of thing. So um, yeah, they're asking for SIT code there, but it's not going to help you with that. You do need to know it. Okay, so that section one should be fairly straightforward for anyone that's done anything with that particular client. The second section um, is looking for contact and agent details for the claim. So something else that um, HMRC are now mandating is that a senior officer at the claimant company signs off on the claim in some way. So this seems to be moving towards that. So you first of all, as an agent, you're asked for your details. You're asked whether you are purely doing the R&D or whether that you are the tax agent as well. Um, and you need to give a name, a business name, phone number, email address and business address for any and all agents and advisors involved in the claim. So if you are the tax agent, but you didn't prepare the claim, you'll need those details for the company that prepared the claim as well as yourself. Um, and then for the senior officer of the claimant company, so you need to have someone who, because I'm 90% sure what this is then going to do is ping an email to that senior officer and ask them to acknowledge the claim at least. It doesn't say for sure, but I'm assuming that's what this is aimed at. Um, and for them, you need to provide the name, their role, phone number and email address. So again, if you're working with the client, you should have that. But obviously this has to be a senior officer. So if you've been working with someone that isn't the senior officer of the company, you're going to need to ask them who in the company is going to sign off on the claim. Um, so just making sure you've got all those details up front should be fairly straightforward. The third section is super simple um, and it just asks for the accounting period that this additional information form is covering. So it uses in accounting periods. So I'm using accounting period and corporation tax period here because that's what HMRC do. The title of section three is accounting period. And then when you go into it, it asks for the start date of the corporation tax period and the end date of the corporation tax period. And this is where I was saying you can't, these can't be more than 12 months apart. So you have to put in your dates and then it asks whether this is a part of a longer period account of accounts. 
And that's just a yes, no question. It doesn't then say what are the dates of the other periods or anything like that. So again, I don't envy whoever it is at HMRC that's going to have to line these up with different CT600s, but all you can put in there is start date, the end date and answer the question about whether it's a longer period of time. So again, if you've worked with the client at all, you will have that information. So, sorry, my slides have decided not to move. Um, the net, section four is then really long and really detailed and covers qualifying expenditure and products, projects. So the first part you're walked through is which schemes are you, is, are you claiming through or is your client claiming through? So a simple, you choose SME, RDEC or both. And then it goes through which cost categories are you claiming for under SME? Um, and you have to tick a box. So it's got the, I think, six or seven different cost categories you could have. And you're ticking boxes down the way for which of those. And then it asks, OK, what's the total qualifying expenditure under each of those categories? So you need to have worked out maybe what the overall expenditure was, how much was R&D, how much was each scheme to then enter it into the form. You then do that all through again for RDEC. So it says which cost categories are you claiming for under RDEC? And what was the total qualifying expenditure for each one? There's no, there's no guidance in this. So obviously, as we all know, under RDEC, you can't claim for limited company subcontractors. It doesn't say that. It doesn't check anything you're putting in. It's very, very passive. You just put it in. And as long as the numbers add up um, at later points, that's the only validation it does is making sure the maths work. It doesn't check anything about which schemes, which categories, anything like that. So it will just accept what you put in. Now, the one part of this that I think is newest in terms of information submitted to HMRC is they then, for each scheme, ask how much of the qualifying expenditure is the result of qualifying indirect activities. Now, I've never seen HMRC ask for this before. Obviously, they've never mandated any information, but it's never been something that I've seen come up in inquiries particularly or anything like that. So what they do is say, right, you've put in that the total under our deck is £100,000. How much of this in, you know, as an exact number was qualifying indirect activities? How companies are going to arrive at that number, I don't know. Uh, Whisper claims what we are asking is just what percentage of this was indirect versus direct. You'll need to work out yourself for your processes how you want to come to that number with your client. Um, I'm assuming... This, again, is a data gathering exercise in some ways by HMRC, looking at how many companies claim purely for qualifying indirect activities and which are um, actually claiming for directly qualifying activities. Um, it does, however, have a link from there to exactly what qualifying indirect activities are. So that's your usual kind of payroll training, all the sort of bits and pieces that happen around R&D. Um, but it's a, it is a set list. So you need to be familiar with that again for when you're trying to do that calculation with your client. So... First section done, it gives you a summary of the total amount you put through and the categories you've entered that into. The next part asks for the number of projects being claimed for. So this is the total projects, whether it's one project, whether it's 700, they want to know the number of projects being claimed for. It then asks for these detailed descriptions of a subset of those projects. So what it will do is you need to put in somewhere between one and 10 projects. So if your claimant company only did one to three projects, you have to describe all of them. If the claimant company did between three and 10, what HMRC want is a minimum of three projects to be described and you have to cover 50% of the eligible expenditure. So you need to make sure that you're describing the larger projects because then you, you have to do fewer overall. If the company's done more than 10, then HMRC needs between three and 10. And again, covering 50% of the turnover of the, sorry, 50% of the eligible expenditure or 10 projects, whichever happens first. So you can see for some of your clients who do lots and lots and lots of small projects, you are going to have to do 10 project descriptions, which is a huge amount of work to put in. Um, and for each project, it asks for, I'm trying to remember to slide on this. Yes. Um, so. What it does is it asks, you know, put in a project description and for each one, it says, what's the title? What's the main area of science and technology? What was the scientific or technological knowledge that existed at the start of the project? So what was the baseline? What was possible? Why couldn't you use that? Um, it asks for the advance in scientific or technological knowledge sort. sort. So 
you know, what were they trying to do? What were they trying to achieve? The scientific and technological uncertainties faced. So again, what um what were the challenges they faced along the way? Why was this not certain? What were the what were the points at which it seemed unfeasible to even make that advance? And then how the project sought to overcome the uncertainty. So what did they do? What were the resolutions they came to? Now, for all of these, there's a 20,000 character limit. 20,000 characters is six to 10 pages of A4. I don't think HMRC needs 80,000 characters of description, but if you're if your client has a particularly technically challenging project, perhaps you might need that. Um, we would recommend much, much less than that, probably 500 to 1,000 characters for each one, because otherwise you're in danger of putting in information on the commercial aspects of it and generally kind of potentially prejudicing HMRC against the claim because you've put in detail that doesn't actually matter to them. So... As you go through, what it will do is ask you about that project. It will ask you about, sorry, um, it will ask you about what the whether that project was SME or RDEC. It will ask you how much SME and how much RDEC spending there was, and it's in the background adding up whether you've hit your fifty percent limit yet. So you have to put in. If you said you did more than three projects, it's going to make you do three, no matter whether you've hit the fifty percent or not. Once you get above that, and again. This is where the form is a little lacking. It continues just to ask, do you want to add another project description? If you say no and you haven't put enough, it just takes you to a page saying, sorry, you've not added enough and you have to go back. So you really need to be aware of how many projects you need to do to begin with because it's a, it would be a pain to work that through um, and let the form itself tell you how many projects. So you need to have worked out how many and which projects to describe to get to the 50% of eligible expenditure or the three projects that it will require. So... That sounds like a huge amount. Uh, so I'm going to pass to Suze to talk through kind of what we're doing at Whisper Claims to help with all of this. Thank you, Jen. That was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, I think probably there's a lot of you sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, this is a lot. And, and it is a lot, um, particularly from a, a time and efficiency perspective. Uh, we recognise that some accountants are choosing to walk away from this type of work because they're feeling potentially overwhelmed by the additional layers of complexity and due to the potentially reduced cost effectiveness of providing an R&D tax service. Um, these new protocols are part of HMRC's wider commitment to reduce fraud and error within the scheme. So it is all being done for the right reasons. And it's important to keep your clients safely away from providers who may not be taking as good care of them as you will. So our overriding message for today is Please don't let this put you off. You're already doing the work when it comes to assessing your client's projects for eligibility. You now need to spend some additional time working with your clients to write up uh, projects for the additional information form. And Whisper Claims has a solution to make the completion of the form as pain-free and seamless as possible. Um, so with the slide that uh, Jen has in front of you there, um, the biggest challenges being mandated are the specified number of projects proportional to how many are being claimed for, and as Jen said, the, the amount of qualifying spend. Um, our Whisper Claims app is going to include an additional question to help you work this out in advance, so you know how many projects in advance you will need to have prepared and written up prior to filling out the additional information form, which is obviously very handy because the last thing you want to have to do, as Jen's already said, is mid-form filling, have to go back to your customer to get additional project information from them. Um, costs per project will need to be declared and uh, very shortly we'll be releasing our new project by project cost feature to ensure that spend is routed appropriately where grants etc are involved and in an output that is compatible with the additional information form so this will be an easy copy and paste exercise and in fact this output will include all the data that HMRC asked for so again as Jen's already discussed the form is extensive Data is wiped after 28 days, if not completed uh, in, in that time period. And um, unless you download um, the PDF that Jen mentioned, there is no ability to review uh, um, or save the inputs once the form is submitted, which could have ramifications if any of the information is ever queried by HMRC down the line. Um, HMRC have already um, declared that they will not be offering any integrations or APIs. 
So along with the Whisper Claims reports uh, in PDF and Word formats, um, our customers will soon uh, be introduced to um, a third output in Word format containing only the information that HMRC is asking for that will map the fields to uh, the additional information form, making the whole process of filling in the form super simple. And it also means that you have a copy of exactly what has been uploaded and submitted in black and white should you need to refer to it at a later date. So those are all the things um, that Whisper Claims is, is doing to help. Um, on top of that, uh, as anybody who is already a customer of ours will know, uh, we are here in the background to support our customers with any questions that they have about how to fill out the form, um, about the forms in general, about scheme or eligibility related queries that we're already here for through our advice line channels, which is email, uh, live chat, um, the WhatsApp group, um, we will continue to offer our claim review service to help you make sure that product descriptions, costs and the way that your claims hang together is double checked before submission, um, which is um, just an additional add on, an extra, an extra layer of reassurance should any of our customers feel they need that. And um, I think we've got um, another slide uh, to do with um, some additional um, services and tools and support and educational content that we have, again, just to keep you right. Um, anybody who's joining the call today, um, just to let you know, if you've missed any bits, you arrive late or you want to watch this back, we will be sending out a recording um, of today's session uh, via email. Um, if you want to take a look at our YouTube channel, if you're not already a customer, you've got previews and some of our uh, public facing uh, content available for you to um, indulge yourselves in. And for any customers, you've also got the eligibility uh, library that you can tap into for training, case study material, that sort of thing as well, that's going to keep you right. Um, and I think it's WhatsApp next, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and for any customers joining us today who are not part of our WhatsApp group, if not, why not? Um, <laughs> our WhatsApp group is um, a vibrant and supportive space where members post questions, seek clarification and provide help and insights to each other when it comes to addressing R&D tax related issues. Uh, we're obviously here in the background to moderate the group and ensure that everyone has a positive experience and also share things like scheme updates as and when we receive them. Um, invites to events like this, that sort of thing. Um, finally, um, if anybody has any questions um, today, do feel free to get in touch. Um, and if there's anybody joining us today uh, who is not a customer already and would like to hear more about how we're helping our customers through these challenging times, please do feel free to um, send me an email um, or drop me a message um, uh, in my calendar, uh, drop me a, a meeting, sorry, in my calendar. I've just posted a link to my email address and my calendar link as well. Uh, let's have a chat and maybe we can organize a demo at a later date if you feel that that would be appropriate. Um, I can see we've got a question waiting for us already, Jen. I think we've possibly covered it, but it's just worth reiterating um, from David. Um, can you paste information into the form, i.e. can the information be worked on or saved as a local source document with the various narrative text pasted into the AIF? Yes, you can. And I would probably recommend that purely because the text boxes that you're pasting into, so all those different ones around advanced uncertainties, all that kind of thing, are really small on the page. Um, so it's if you want to be working on a narrative, you can probably only see about 10 lines of it on the screen at one time. So even just for your own ease of use, working in it in an offline working on it in an offline place and then copying and pasting in would seem much, much more sensible. But yeah, you can absolutely copy and paste. As far as I can tell, you can copy and paste into any and all of the fields. Super, thanks, Jen. Um, question from Martin. Uh, do you still need to notify HMRC that you will be submitting a claim within six months of CT600 year end date? Yeah, so this is something we went back and forth on whether to mention that in this webinar. Um, yes, that is coming in, or it's live now, but that's only for claims starting on or after the 1st of April 2023. So yes, you do. Um, but obviously, most of those claims or those accounting periods won't finish until end of March next year. So it'll be kind of in the first six months of, you know, from after 1st of April next year that we'll really see the notification thing coming in. We've got a little bit more information on that. We've had to go back to HMRC for some clarification on some of their guidance um, that we'll be putting out really soon. But yeah, definitely that's still, as far as we're aware, definitely come or is definitely live, is definitely happening. 
and will affect any claims that started on or after the 1st of April 2023. But as I say, we're not expecting to see many notification forms needing filled out anytime soon just because of obviously the nature of accounting periods and that kind of thing. Okay. We've been very quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anybody does have any questions that they would prefer to ask offline, um, please feel free to um, drop us a message. If you're not already a customer at our hello at whisperclaims.co.uk email address. If you are a customer, obviously, um, you can log into the portal and use the live chat function or email us from within the app as well, which will get you straight through to support. So um, please do feel free to, to get in touch. Um, oh, another question coming in. There we go. Um, no problem, Martin. Uh, so it's for accounting periods that start after the 1st of April 2023. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's, as I say, the one of the reasons that the R&D tax relief sector is scrambling a little bit is we were expecting the additional information form for to come in just for those accounting periods as well. And that was the, the big change that uh, was snuck in at the spring budget. Um, but yeah, so there's a kind of, there's two new forms, both released, both live, but there's a very different set of claims that will be affected by both. And that's why we're talking more about the additional information form at the moment, because that is affecting, you know, it's a blanket thing. It's a date thing. It doesn't matter the date of the claim or anything like that. It just starts on a certain date and you have to use it. Um, and I suppose our feeling internally is that I'm not sure HMRC have done enough to advertise this fact. It wasn't announced at the budget. It was kind of um snuck in in the kind of budget documentation so if anyone hadn't read it there's been no announcement nothing has come out in a kind of big way to say that this needs done so we're trying to get the the message out there as much as we can because we don't want the last thing we want is our clients and other people in the sector to suddenly realize mid-august that they haven't gathered enough information for their clients claims and have to do to go back and they're unable to submit or worse continue to submit claims the way they do now without the form and find that they're all invalid and thrown out by HMRC. So I think it's a really, really important thing that people know this and everyone that's on the call, if you want to go out and tell anybody else you know that's doing R&D claims that this is coming in and they need to be ready for it. Um, I think the sector needs to shout about it a lot more than we are doing. Is it worth mentioning, Jen, to anybody who's a customer of ours that's already started preparing claims as well that maybe just, you know, got the first few Yeah, bits yeah. So the it. one, <laughs> obviously, as I say, we're, internally scrambling a little bit because we thought we had a lot more time to put in the changes that we we're doing so the the our developers are working really really hard but what we would recommend is that anyone that's processing claims through the whisper claims app um if you're processing them prior to probably mid-july at this point make sure you submit them before the first of august because they will be the old style and they won't have that third output that Suze is talking about um it's a huge change for us in the way that we're gathering costs and dividing them up so there's a huge amount of work we have to do. We're not going to be able to get that in a huge amount before the 1st of August. So again, anyone that's got claims in progress in the app, anyone that knows that they could get them in to save yourself the rework, potential for error, potential for them being um, not ready, get them in as quickly as you can. We are obviously working on our side as quickly as we can to get this done. But if you could work with us and put as many claims through before the 1st of August as you could, that really helps us as well. Um, I've got a question from Robin. Thanks, Robin. Um, will an R&D report still need to be submitted with the CT600? So it's an interesting question, this one, because there was never a need, as in it wasn't mandated by HMRC, to submit a report. Um, I would say yes. I would recommend doing it. Um, it's always been best practice to submit a report, obviously, with the CT600. Um, I still think it's really important because, as you can see from the forum, for example, it doesn't at any point ask why you're claiming some under RDEC or some under SME. It doesn't ask about company structure and why you would justify being an SME versus a large company. There's there's a lot that I would have said was fairly standard information about an R&D claim that, that, that the form doesn't ask for. Um, so I would still recommend putting the report in. I think it's, again, it's that belt and braces approach of you're doing the form and you're submitting a report. They cannot say they didn't get the information about the claim. So... I think it's best practice. I think it's also really good practice to still produce a really comprehensive report for your clients as well. So they can see laid out clearly the assumptions or the decisions that you've made about them as a company, their structure, 
whether they're audit, whether it's me, all of that kind of thing. I think having almost a line in the sand, this is what we we had, the decisions we made on this date, here's a full documented thing, it's gone to HMRC, the client's got it, we've got it, everyone's on the same page. There's a lot of benefit to producing a report and sending it to HMRC above and beyond the fact that you're putting information into the additional information form as well. Thanks, Jan. Um, I've had a um, question from Elliot. Thanks, Elliot. Um, what happens to the CT600 claims for which the form has not been submitted? So HMRC's wording on this is if their if form isn't submitted, they will remove the claim from the CT600. So exactly what that means, I don't know, but um, essentially they will ignore any claim for R&D tax relief where they haven't received an, an additional information form at the right time. So it's, yeah, I don't know whether, I don't think they'll reject the CT600. They'll, they will just um just remove the r d claim from it i am assuming again because you can send in an amended ct600 if you then resubmitted that one with a form if you sent it in as if it were amended that might work they have said that the other way around if you amend your ct600 in a way that affects the r d claim it's a good idea to redo the form so send in another form but again you'd have to start from scratch on that so I don't know whether they would want it the other way around as well, where if you realised that you didn't tick all the right boxes or you hadn't submitted the form, whether they would want the CT600 resubmitted. But the wording they have is if you submit CT600 without an additional information form, they will remove the R&D claim from the CT600. Thank you, Jen. Um, is that it from everyone today? If it is, that's fine. If you've got a bit of extra time to go away and enjoy your lunch break this Tuesday. Um, Give you another couple of seconds if anyone's furiously typing just to get any final questions through today. Okay, if that is, oh, no, thank you, Anna. Um, if that is it from everyone, um, thank you to everyone so much um, for joining us. As always, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, hopefully we've given you um, lots to think about and um, some useful tips to help you stay safely within the guidelines. Please do keep an eye out um, on invites to uh, additional webinars. We've got um, various types of content that's being um, uh, pushed out in the next few weeks, just again, just to make sure that everybody is up to date and as informed as possible. Um, as I said already, any clients who've got any questions of ours, please do get in touch during using the usual channels. And if anybody else wants to get in touch, um, do reach out and we'll be very happy to um, have a chat with you. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and we will see you soon. Bye.